Hey guys, it's Connor, and today we're gonna to do something a little bit different. We're gonna do a full cinematography breakdown and behind the scenes look at one of the music videos I shot recently. I found these types of videos really helpful when I was first starting out. I learned a ton through watching videos like these, so hopefully I can help you do the same. If you haven't seen the music video yet, I'll leave a link to that. I really suggest you go and watch the full video first so you get the full picture of what we're about to break down. I'm gonna leave timestamps in the description if you wanna to jump to any particular section, you just wanna learn about the lighting or the lenses used or anything like that, you can jump around as you want. And I really suggest grabbing yourself some hot chocolate or tea, because this is gonna be a long video, so let's jump right into it. Today we're talking about Bastion and their music video for Nothing But Ash. I sat down with the band and the first thing we did was coordinate the concept and translate that into a video treatment. So they've gone through some lineup changes and changed their sound a decent amount, so they wanted to do something different from music videos that they've done in the past. They wanted something very straightforward, very raw, just a performance video, and they wanted something that was short, fast, and intense to match the song that they were using as well. This one was a little bit interesting in we built the entire video concept around the location. So one of the band members has access to a music venue here in Vancouver called the Vogue Theatre. And so we had the opportunity to shoot there. It's a giant venue with full lighting rig and it was a really great opportunity. So we thought we definitely have to shoot there. So we kind of built it with that in mind. The last thing the band requested is that they wanted to be arranged in a circle. So I needed to figure out a way to sort of light that 360 while still having the lighting really dynamic and punchy and moody and all of that kind of stuff. And on that note, Let's talk about the lighting. These renders here are done in CineTracer. If you don't have CineTracer, I don't know what you're doing with your life. I'm gonna leave a link to my review of that software. It's essentially a video game that's really easy to use and you can use it to plan out your video shoots in 3D and see exactly what they're gonna look like. So I really recommend it. But anyways, this is what I used to sort of sketch out these lighting setups. Because they were arranged in a circle, I needed to figure out a way to light 360 while still making it punchy and dynamic. So what I ended up doing was putting two quasar tubes on the ground and two in the center. The two tubes on the ground are always on and they're essentially providing sort of an edge light uh, or even a, a far side key light if depending on where my camera angle is at the time. The two in the center were gonna be set to flicker and then the plan was to color grade them a little bit yellow or green to kind of give off the vibe that they're these old broken fluorescents, which I thought would really help the mood of a raw, fast, and heavy song. This is just a single setup, but there's two slightly different lighting looks throughout. So the first is just with all of these lights on, and we also have overhead lights from the stage lights. This was gonna be our main setup throughout most of the song. So they've got a top light, they've got sort of the front lights that are flickering, and then they've got the edge lights with the quasar tubes on the ground. So no matter where I'm standing, I've always got kind of cool lighting on each individual person. So it kind of worked out, it's just a very simple lighting setup, but no matter where I'm standing, no matter what camera angle I had, I had a good balance between lighting them and still having enough shadow for it to be interesting and dynamic. The second setup is more like the one on the right hand side that you see here where the top lights are off and it's just all the quasars turned on. So in this shot I've just got the floor ones on but the middle ones were also going to be flickering too and that would just be for heavier sections throughout the song. Here's a good shot of the whole setup. The only thing that I ended up changing here between the treatment and the actual video is you may have noticed that the lights in the middle are no longer in that cross pattern. They're actually just straight horizontal. And the reason for that is when I got on set, I took the RGB quasars, put them on the short circuit setting so they started flickering, and I noticed that because my camera has rolling shutter, I would only get parts of the frame that were lit up or turned off depending on when it was flashing in relation to the sensor reading out those pixels. So long story short, any time the light flashed, it would light up maybe half the frame and then the bottom half didn't have that flicker in there. So it looked a little bit weird, it looked a little bit glitchy. So I decided to just roll with the punches. I tried different orientations to see if we can sort of change the pattern of that flicker. And sure enough, putting them horizontal still had the same issue. If you look close, there's still flicker in part of the frame, but not the full frame but it looked a lot more natural and uh, it just worked a lot better than these sort of odd uh, sporadic kind of glitchy effects that I was getting with them set up as a cross. Now there's one big catch with lighting 360 and shooting 360 at this venue and that catch was that we couldn't 
actually do true 360 because as soon as we start to come around to that far side behind the drummer in this setup, you would see all the seating and where the audience would be at the venue. We didn't have a big black curtain that we could put up right at the front of the venue to block all of that out, or at the front of the stage rather. So what we did is I got a little bit clever with it and decided, okay, we're gonna shoot a bunch of footage facing this way, and then we're gonna flip the entire band and we're going to put a black curtain against that far wall. So in this shot, you can see that there's the drummer, there's the door behind him, and then when we flip around, the vocalist is actually facing that exact same wall. His back is to that wall that the drummer's back was to, but we just put a curtain in front of it. So now it looks like two different walls. So that was the only tricky thing, and we had to arrange the shot list in order to do a bunch of shots in one direction with one setup, and then the opposite direction with the mirrored setup. So the two floor quasars were set to 100% brightness, but the RGB quasars that were flickering in the middle were actually set to 60%. And the biggest reason for that wasn't a lighting choice, it was more of just a comfort choice. The quasars are super, super bright, and if they're flashing in your face, it can be really annoying and really uncomfortable. So that was more just for the comfort of the talent on set, because they are all facing these lights and we don't want them to be uncomfortable, getting dizzy or having a hard time performing because of the lighting setup. So we brought those down so we could still get the effect, but everyone was super comfortable. These overhead lights, we tried our best to match them by eye to the same color, the same pure white and white balance as the quasar tubes as best as we could. And they're all at slightly different angles on each individual person. So the four lights are sort of in a row on stage, but each person is obviously standing in a circle. So we had to be a little bit clever with our angles. But what ended up happening is that the drummer and the vocalist have their lights a little bit in front of them. So it really gives a nice wash and really highlights them. Whereas the two guitar players on the outside, their lights were a little bit behind them. So it gave them this nice hair light and added a bit more shadow in front of them and under their chin and stuff like that. So it's just a little bit more dynamic and we just had to be a little bit clever with that because we can't change where those stage lights are set. Now with the overhead lights turned off and just the quasars on, I had to make sure that the lights were arranged in a way that A, we're getting enough light, B, we're still getting the ability to shoot 360 and have dynamic light, and C, it still had to be really punchy and have a lot of depth to it. So luckily that all worked out. No matter where I was, I had a little bit of key light from those flickering quasar tubes in the center, and I had a really nice edge light on everyone because of those tubes on the floor. So each tube on the floor sort of acted as an edge light for two people at any given time. That's it for lighting. It was very simple and it really worked well. So now let's move on to the gear I used and camera movement. Everything here was shot on the Sony a6500 and I only used two lenses for the whole shoot. All the handheld stuff was shot with the Sigma 18 to 35 f1.8 and all of the glide cam 180 shots were shot uh, with obviously a glide cam and a contact Zeiss 28mm 2.8. They're both really sharp lenses, the only difference is essentially the contrast and how much they flare. Uh, so they've cut really well together. I really like how the Sigma looks with my full contact set, and it worked out really well. This is my handheld rig for the shoot. Uh, it's quite rigged up because the A6500 is a very small camera, and in order to make your handheld movement smooth, even with in-body stabilization turned on, it really helps to make that rig heavy because it eliminates a lot of the micro jitter you get. Because it's so heavy and it takes much more force to move, the movement's a lot more smooth as a result. So on it, I've got the camera cage, I've got the uh, battery pack, which is just a phone battery. Uh, I've got a video on that. It's super cheap and it will last your entire video shoot just like it did for me. I've got the Aperture Fine HD monitor on top and I had a set of rails on it as well, just to add to the weight for me. With all that weight, it made going handheld super easy because I could do any movements I want and not worry about micro jitter, but it was still light enough that if I wanted to give it some shake, get some blur going, really mess with the rolling shutter for something crazy, or if I just wanted more of like a Michael Bay crazy chaotic handheld look, I still had the ability to do that. It wasn't so heavy that I couldn't do whatever I wanted with it. The Sigma was always set to 35 millimeters and I had it somewhere around f3.5 for most of the shoot. Um, every single band member had a medium shot with that lens, and then I got a few cross shots where I was shooting across and getting two members at once uh, with all the same focal length and everything like that. 
the handheld work was mostly used in sections that weren't the chorus. I wanted it to be really punchy and uh, chaotic feeling, so it really worked until we got to the chorus where things were a little more straightforward and catchy, so that's when I would switch to those smoother glide cam shots. I set the Contax 28mm to f3.5 as well, and then I just set the focus to the closest person to me, and then I just kept doing 180 shots looping back and forth. So whoever I was closest to was the person that was in focus throughout all of those shots. That's it for the gear. Super straightforward. I only needed those two lenses. This shoot was really stripped down and simple, so it made things really easy for me. There's one very specialized shot here that I planned, and it was going into the breakdown. I wanted to do this sort of spinning transition where the camera comes up, has a shot of the vocalist, and falls into the floor, and then immediately cuts to another shot coming up in the other side. So it's a smooth rotational transition. Here's the raw footage of that rotation. So the first clip we have is this one. We just come up past the vocalist here, and then the camera just sort of falls down. And then the second clip is coming out of the ground here with the full band into the next section. So what I did is I smoothed this transition over by first, I wasn't getting quite enough rotation here, so I cut it and kept rotating the clip. Now obviously there's all this black area that we need to cover up, but that was okay because what I had planned to do to sort of smooth this transition and sell it a little bit more is I added this solid in Premiere that transitions between the two clips. So as we fall, it sort of looks like we go into the ground or we're, we're going past some sort of object that obscures our view and then coming back out. So it really helps sell the transition to have that solid there. I'll show you how I made this object here. So essentially, all it is is just a square shape layer. I then animated it to rotate at the same speed as the camera rotates in the two clips so that it syncs up properly. Then I added a little bit of camera blur because something that close to the camera would be out of focus when we're focused on the vocalist who's further back. So that matched up a little bit more realistically. And then the last thing I did is just change the color of it to make sure that it matched the rest of the scene. So when you look at that same clip with the color grade on and everything, you can see that it really matches the scene quite well. To make the camera move actually happen, what I did is I stuck my camera on the tripod and then I just extended two of the legs of the tripod. So the third one isn't there. So I've got two legs going this way and I can just grab the camera, keep those legs on the ground and spin the camera up and then get my shot and then accelerate it downwards. That's all I had to do and then I just repeated it with the next shot. We're coming out of the ground quickly, showing the shot, falling again. That's all there is to it. I just made sure that we had some sandbags and I had my assistant sort of hold the legs to kind of help me out just to make sure it stayed in place. But that's all you need. You didn't, I didn't need to build a fancy rig to do it. You can just hold a tripod with just two legs extended and spin it. Now in the actual video, this ended up being a two-stage transition. So here we pass behind the amp and then we disappear into that shot of the vocalist and then we have that rotational spin. And that was something sort of spontaneous that just happened on set. I just saw that there was an object there that I could pass behind. I knew I could sort of mask that out to transition into the next shot. And so I just thought, all right, on my next pass with the glide cam, I'm gonna time that perfectly so that I go behind that amp as soon as that section starts. The easiest way to make all of these elements work and sync up properly, which is really hard to time them when they're not rhythmically based, I shot all those clips in 60 frames a second so that I could then slow it down or speed it up however I needed to in Premiere in order to make the timing just perfect and flawless. So that's a little tip I have for you. If you're trying to make a certain transition work, shoot it in 60 frames per second so you can adjust the speed however you want. The only other different shot we have here is there's a quick flash of a GoPro on the guitar just when the band is like super big and then it cuts out and it's just that solo guitar riff before the band comes back in. So I thought it'd be kind of cool to sort of echo the dynamic of being huge, being really small, and then coming back huge again with the visuals. So I start, you've got the normal camera angles, everything looks great and punchy, and then for that guitar riff, it's just a sort of lo-fi look with the GoPro, and then it cuts out, and then the full band comes back in. That was just a little clamp mount uh, with a little arm and the GoPro attached to it. And then a little bit of stabilization in post just because it was looking a little bit shaky. That arm isn't 100% perfect. That's it for all the gear and the camera movements. Now let's talk about picture profiles and the color grading. 
Everything you see here is shot on S-Log2, but it's a modified version of S-Log2. I use what's called Omenio primers. Uh, I hope that's how you say it. They're these picture profiles that are specifically designed to minimize things like banding and artifacts to maximize the dynamic range and make sure you have the most accurate colors possible. So they're these finely tuned, calculated uh, profiles. The, the profiles are available for free, but the transformation LUTs to get them back from a log profile to Rec. 709, those are paid. So I did buy them myself, but I really, really like them. I've tried a few different paid profiles and I just, they're really good. I think the colors just look really natural. I cannot speak to all their individual claims about reducing banding and things like that because I just haven't done the testing myself, but I can say overall, I just feel like it, it just looks better Everything just handles color grading a little bit easier, and I'm really happy with them. I'm not affiliated with these guys, but I'll leave a link to those Omenio primers in the description if you want to grab those for your Sony camera as well. They've got primers for tons of cameras, tons of different Sonys, RED cameras, Canons, you name it. So go check them out and see if that interests you at all. So here's what the completely ungraded footage looked like straight out of camera. And the first thing I did was take an instance of Lumetri Color. And I just put on their base LUT. Uh, they have a few different LUTs to transform it from log to rec 709. Uh, some are more punchy, some have sort of a film look. I just wanted something super simple because I wanted full control. So I just put on the base LUT and here's what that looks like here. The only other thing that I did was I brought the whites down because I felt that after the whole color grade process was done, it was just a little bit bright, these, these quasar tubes, and they were a little bit distracting from the talent. And sometimes when you bring down the whites a little bit, as long as you've exposed everything really well, it kind of adds this impression of your camera having more dynamic range than it actually does. Cause I think we're used to seeing things a little bit lower. It just, it's a cool little bit more cinematic look and it's a nice trick. If you expose properly and bring down those whites just a little bit, it can help out. So I just drop them down to 30. As far as the actual look goes, we'll turn that on here. And I wanted something a little bit David Fincher-esque. I really like how he plays with blues and yellows and really sets a mood with those colors. So I wanted something sort of cold, but I wanted some yellow greeny tint uh, in the highlights, sort of like The Matrix or Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. There's sort of that sickly look to it. And I thought with such a, a raw, aggressive song, I didn't want something that if you turn this grade off, it's pretty warm and it doesn't really fit the song and fit the aesthetic. So this was just a little bit more stylized. I think it looks a little more cinematic and it's got that sort of sickly vibe that just really fits. To pull that off, all I did was actually use a stock Premiere Pro LUT. I used SL Big, but I used the high dynamic range one just in case I don't want any LUTs clipping anything for me or increasing contrast. And then I just dropped the intensity to 50%. If you see that at 100, Basically what it's doing is adding a lot of blue into my shadows, but still keeping the darkest shadows true black. That's a mistake a lot of people make is they'll add color into their shadows. Most of the time it's blue and then the blackest areas become blue and it looks unnatural and they don't really understand why. And that's because your blacks should still be true black. They shouldn't be colored. That's not how our eyes see things. That's not how it should look. So that's what I like about this LUT right off the bat. So dropped it to 50%. And then all I did was take the highlights with the color wheels and bring them a little bit towards green just to make them a little bit more gross and sick looking. So if I turn that off, the highlights are definitely more pink and a little bit more natural. I turn that back on and now we have sort of that gross fluorescent color cast that we get. So it really helped sell that look of those being sort of like broken fluorescent tubes. This same treatment was done across the board. The only difference is that in the darker sections where the overhead lights are turned off, I also pulled the shadows down to negative 20 just to make it a little bit darker, a little bit moodier and punchier and just help. I feel like it needed a little bit more contrast between having those overhead lights on and having them off. So I thought, well, I'll just darken up the scene a little bit more and it, it did help quite a bit. The very last thing we're going to go over is sound design. There was a little bit of sound design work that I did in the beginning of this video. It was just an idea that I had as sort of an intro. The song just hits so hard that I thought it would be kind of nice to have an intro that contrasts that a little bit. I just, I didn't want people to just hit play and then just get hit full force with the song. I sort of wanted it to have more of, of an impact. And in order to do that, I thought, well, I'll do a little bit of an intro that's very silent, very stripped down, very quiet. And so in the beginning here, I'll play it for you. 
we've got the lights buzzing and we've got the guitarist fiddling with the knobs plugging it into the amp and then we've got the drummer doing a count in on his leg there and all of that is sound design none of that sound was captured on set i just use freesounds.org i don't know if you guys have used that before but it's really really handy go on there sign up and just search for any sounds that are licensed under creative commons zero license those are free to use for commercial use you can even sell them if you want you can do anything with those sounds so they're full royalty free options Super simple job here. As soon as the video starts, I've got the buzzing happening and I just cut the buzz in line with the flicker. I just went frame by frame and saw when that flicker was happening. So I'd cut the sound for that brief moment and then it came back in. As it cuts to the next shot, I drop the volume just because it helps sell the illusion of creating spatial awareness. You know, being further away from the sound, it would be quieter. So as we cut, drop the volume on that buzzing a little bit. Same thing with this one here. And then we've got the sound effect of plugging the guitar in. And then finally, I've got two sound effects merged on top of each other. I believe it was someone like just patting their leg or something. And then the sound of a drumstick being hit on another drumstick. I just merged them together and it sounds like he's just capping the drumstick on his knee. And then that just goes straight into the song. That is the full breakdown for Bastion's Nothing But Ash. If you have any questions or anything that I missed, let me know and I'm more than happy to answer those questions for you. And if you liked this video, if it helped you out, if you learned something, I'd really appreciate you helping me back by liking, subscribing, all the stuff you already know how to do. And until then, I will see you in the next video. Peace.